Dope. Let's do it. All right. Welcome. Welcome, one and all. Uh, it is Sunday. Uh, we are thrilled to have you all with us. Thank you so much uh, for joining us once again for uh, a session devoted to Cabernet Franc uh, with a very special guest, uh, one of our foremost wine crush objects, Laura Grennan uh, Bissell uh, will be joining us. Uh, Zoe uh, will be uh, with me as always. We're talking Cabernet Franc, the other Cabernet. Uh, it gets short shrift. It is actually the OG uh, Cabernet Franc, predates uh, Cab Sauvignon, um, but doesn't get the credit it deserves for being as transformatively uh, and you know utterly delicious. Um, and terroir expressive uh, as it can be. But we're going to dispel those myths and proclaim its greatness uh, today uh, with one of California's uh, foremost um, kind of non-interventionist uh, negotiant uh, style winemakers. And uh, I think one of the most casually profound uh, people uh, in uh, the wine business today, that being Laura Brennan Bissell, um, who is a Washington DC native um, one of the few winemakers I know of that can claim uh, the black cat on her CV, which you know pretty much makes her the coolest person uh, that any of us know. Um, at any rate, uh, she makes wine in California. She is joining us all the way from Kauai, uh, the Garden Isle uh, of the Hawaiian Island chain, and uh, hopefully we'll get a fuller story on uh, why she's out there, although you don't really need an excuse to uh, be in Hawaii. I think Hawaii is excuse enough. Uh, Zoe is with us. Say hi to the people, Zoe. Hi, everyone. Happy Sunday. Lovely. Um, a bit of mea culpa here. Um, we had uh, some issues with delivery, um, some uh, related to uh, our newest uh, distribution partner for the sake of Laura's wine, some related to the weather. Uh, I wholeheartedly apologize. Uh, we will uh, absolutely make it right. Uh, I'm gonna cover uh, the order in which we'll be drinking through the new plates that uh, we covered, uh, uh, that we offered uh, for sale this week um, after we get everyone on board here. Uh, so kind of uh, stay tuned. Uh, you should never wait to drink you know, please, 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 um, you know, feel free to uh, sample whatever you like. Don't wait uh, for uh, my permission to do so. Uh, that said, we have two flights um, this week, one devoted to the old world, one devoted to the new with three uh, fabulous uh, archetypes uh, for the sake of these individual wines. And uh, I recommend, as always, having uh, three glasses, if at all possible, so that you can uh, move between uh, wines uh, fluidly, go back and forth, uh, and use them kind of as dramatic foils, uh, the one uh, for the other, uh, for the sake of this lesson. So uh, without further ado, um, giving you all a few minutes to straggle late uh, into class. Uh, thank you again. Uh, for joining us. Uh, Laura Brennan Bissell is with us all the way uh, from uh, the beautiful, the verdant Kauai, Hawaii. Uh, Laura, uh, hello to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. And I'm sorry I was running a tiny bit late. It kind of tried to pack a couple things in. It's morning here. So um, I'm I'm super stoked to be participating in something with a with a DC restaurant, and I like loved Bill's wine list and the food you guys have for a long time. It's kind of my staple spot whenever I'm in the city. So this is very exciting. It, be it beats the jumbo slices of my youth in that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're they're still there. Uh, they they call tantalizingly to me at you know off hours, Laura, uh, when I'm on my way home, and I, I'm only so strong. I can only resist that urge. <laughs> Uh, you know, for, for so long. Um, uh, Laura makes wine in, in California. Um, and uh, some of you um, uh, have purchased a flight um, that uh, we offered featuring uh, her uh, wines. Uh, sadly, I, I got shafted by my distributor um, and uh, the weather. Uh, FedEx did me no favors. Uh, so we weren't able to bring in as much of that wine as I would have liked. Um, for those of you that got the New World flight, uh, we replaced it um, with a very different wine from Morton Halgren out of uh, the Finger Lakes. So some of you have Laura's wine, some of you have Morton's wines. We're going to talk over Laura's uh, wine because um, she is with us and I want you to drink her wine and we're going all Oprah on her like special annual show. So if you didn't get Laura's wine and you promised uh, a, bo or a taste uh, as part of our flight, we're going to give you a full bottle 
uh, a full bottle of Laura's Capronk when it comes in next week. Um, and, uh, you know, I should say that for all of you that are joining us today, uh, we'll have a special discount code uh, in the lesson recap for you to stock up on all these wines. Uh, because uh, the ancient root of sommelier is actually a word for uh, one who provisions, um, uh, basically uh, someone that was looking after a nobleman's good. And uh, I failed a bit uh, in that duty this week, uh, you know, weather and fate intervened, but uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I thank you all for, for joining us and uh, could not be more excited. Actually got a little too excited uh, for a lawyer to be with us because um, it was the first time I'd worked with this particular distributor and they, they didn't do me any favors, but um, uh, I was irrationally uh, excited that Laura's uh, wines were available again uh, in this market because they, they haven't been uh, for too long. Um, and, you know, we've really enjoyed featuring them in the past and are excited to be able to feature them uh, going forward. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, we are going to dive in. Um, I just want to let you know for the sake of, you know, the order in which we're covering the wines, we're going to go New World first, followed by Old World, and then kick it off with uh, uh, Laura's Cap Franc. I'm going to move into uh, the Finger Lakes, um, Virginia, uh, thereafter followed by Chile Le, um, and then move into the Old World archetypes, uh, Burgay, Summer Champagne, and uh, Chinois uh, to close things up. Uh, Laura, did you manage to track down a Cabernet Franc of your own to enjoy at uh, 11 o'clock in Hawaii? I, I did not, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> I actually, I have another meeting after this, so I am uh, drinking a... Uh, uh, agree now. <laughs> I, I have one of those too. So you're in good. You're in good. You're in good company. But I, I, I did. I did. Um, I did a tasting the other day, and I also they were drinking the Cab Franc too. Um, and I had a rum daiquiri then. But I realized that that at 11 a.m. actually kind of screws up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no worries. Has the uh, has the Zoom feature been a regular part of your pandemic marketing experience? No, um, I actually, so at the beginning of this year, I moved away from being on social media and like have just tried to move away from being like on my computer and on my phone, like trying to get my screen time down to like once a day or one hour or two hours a day. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have a farm up in Washington too now, so I'm, I'm outside most of the time. Um, and I've found that that's actually worked pretty well. Like I, I like these Zoom calls though. Like this is, this is kind of a newer thing. I've been in Kauai for a while alone with my kids and my husband just came to meet me. So now I have more bandwidth to do it a little bit, but it's, it's been really cool to connect. So I'm, I'm surprised how much I enjoy doing it. <laughs> Uh, they are insidiously uh, fun, um, you know, no substitute for, you know, interaction across the bar, but um, we are on, you know, lesson 44 now, and it's been uh, a wild and fabulously fun ride. Um, so uh, without further ado, we always kick things off with a bit of uh, verse um, here at uh, Tielka Wine School, and uh, this is uh, by a popular demand, uh, Rimbaud. Uh, which feels fitting uh, for a, a lesson devoted to a very uh, classically French varietal. Uh, this is time without end. Uh, we have found it again, what time without end. Tis the ocean gone for a walk with the sun. Soul, you sentinel murmur and confess, day is fiery hell. Nothing, or night rather, is nothingness. From the common urges, from the human highest. Far thy path diverges, following thou fliest. No expectancy, no orienteur. Uh, science patiently, punishment is sure. From your blaze alone, satin flames of force, duty's breath is blown, no one says, of course. We have found it again, what time without end, tis the ocean gone for a walk with the sun. Um, uh, so thank you, Todd, uh, for, um, you know, uh, properly calling me out for the fact that I had uh, yet to feature uh, Arthur uh, Rimbaud. Uh, he is certainly one of the great uh, celebrators of uh, wine um, in his verse, and I can't think of a better way to kick off a, a Sunday for us devoted to uh, a quintessentially French varietal. Uh, we're covering the other Cabernet, Cabernet Franc here. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, gets the lion's share of, uh, you know, kind of press for the sake of uh, the Cabernet siblings, but Cabernet Franc is the, is the OG uh, very much. Um, first uh, documented um, in the 18th century, it's thought that Actually, Rabelais um, was talking about Cabernet Franc when he was uh, speaking of the wines of Chinon um, and documented the excesses of his protagonists. But, um, you know, there may or may not be any scientific basis to that. Uh, it is 
you know, indisputably uh, has been established that Cap Franc is sufficiently old that its parents are lost to history. Um, you know, it was, you know, kind of first documented in uh, the area of Bordeaux. Um, it has spawned all these other progenies. So um, Cabernet Sauvignon is an offspring of Cab Franc. Um, Carmenier is an offspring of Cab Franc. Merlot is an offspring of Cab Franc. Um, so they are all, you know, part of this very incestuous um, uh, Bordelais family tree. Petit Bordelais, actually not kind of the outlier, not related to anyone. Um, and then uh, Malbec is actually a, a brother of Merlot, but by another mother, Cab Franc, and nothing to do with that. Um, Cab Franc, you know, compared to Cab Sauv, uh, Earlier ripening, um, uh, softer in terms of the quality of tannins, and you know much more aromatic, um, you know which can you know turn people off at times. But you know um, those of us that love the varietal find uh, hugely uh, charming. Um, you know I think for those that you know are immune to Cab Franc's charms and you know prefer Cabernet Sauvignon, they would you know kind of prejudice the the inky, um, you know kind of uh, more uh, robust. Uh, varietal, uh, but Cap Franc is, I think, uniquely terroir expressive in a way that Cabernet Sauvignon misses. Cabernet Sauvignon kind of, you know, it, it just kind of has one speed uh, for the sake of its, a lot of its wines. It can speak in a, a dimmer voice or a louder voice, but it doesn't, you know, change its tune all that much. Uh, I do find that Cap Franc, um, you know, grown on different soils, manipulated in slightly different ways, um, is a wonderfully dynamic grape in a way that my favorite varietals uh, really encapsulate. It's also very cold hardy, uh, so it does uh, spectacularly well um, in uh, the kind of marginal uh, cooler climates that, um, you know, I tend to love for the sake of acid-driven wines, um, for the sake of the kind of wines that we feature at our restaurants and kind of wines we love uh, to drink at home. And uh, its spiritual home, uh, it should be said, is in uh, the Loire Valley, um, in France, uh, France's, you know, garden, uh, as it were, um, established as such um, you know, the 15th, 16th century, the French uh, uh, noblesse um, vacation there, established their home there, built castles there from the famous Truffaut Jean um, that is, um, you know, so important to uh, the Cabernet Francs of Chinon, Burgay, and Summer Champagne, uh, which we're going to cover forthrightly. Um, but I want to keep this brief because uh, we have Laura uh, on uh, the hook uh, from uh, uh, Hawaii, uh, um, making wine in California, but uh, from Kauai. Um, and uh, I want to kick it over to her to talk about, um, you know, this grape and talk about um, her uh, work with it and to introduce, um, you know, her uh, as a winemaker to you all. Um, Laura is uh, this amazing, uh, you know, kind of like punk rock, badass, Pachamama, like wine Buddha character um, who is unintentionally profound every time she opens her mouth. I encourage all of you to check out and I will link to a great podcast she did, Women in Wine. Um, really cool uh, discussion of, you know, uh, how she wears multiple hats um, personally and professionally. Although it is, you know, fascinating to me that you would never hear Albert de Valaine, who's a most famous you know, winemaker in Burgundy, uh, interviewed by Levy Dalton and have to talk about how he balances his fatherhood in Pinot Noir. But uh, neither here nor there. Um, it's a great um, a little podcast and, and speaks to, um, you know, Laura as much as a mother, as a, uh, a human, um, as it does a winemaker. But uh, we're going to double down on Cab Franc. Um, we covered uh, your DC roots, Laura. Um, did you always love wine? Did you grow up in kind of like a wine loving milieu or was it something, something that you came to uh, over time? Because you've had a million careers. You've been like a uh, secret agent, a tattoo artist, like a punk rock groupie, uh, spoken word poet, um, you name it, you have done it in your incredible life. And I'm sure there's an autobiography coming, you know, someday. But uh, where does wine figure in that uh, journey? So interestingly, I had a not wine family at all. Um, we grew up, so I was born in DC proper, grew up in Northern Virginia mainly, in the South a bit too. Um, I mean, my parents pretty much didn't drink wine, like a bottle of like Frisianette or Sutter Home would show up at a party or something. Um, when I was in kindergarten though, my best friend in Vienna, Virginia, her family was Hungarian. Her parents used to drink wine. Um, and when people ask me how I got into wine, I always like the short answer for me is always that I love the way things smell. And it's the truth. I mean, since I was little, little, like very young, I wanted to smell everything and, you know, to a level of like excess or, you know, maybe it seems a little weird, but um, I remember watching her parents at a dinner party, like smelling their wine and talking about the way it smelled. And I was just like, 
people do that. Like it's, there's nothing weird about liking smell. Okay. So I became kind of like interested in wine from a very young age, obviously, you know, when I was six, I wasn't like walking to a wine shop and, you know, asking about um, coat roti, but I was, I was open. I, I recognized that there was this thing in the world called wine that people talked about the way it smelled and tasted. Um, so as I got, you know, a bit older, I had a pretty rambunctious early life. I mean, and not even just in the like, um, you know, like punk rock way, but in the like having a kid when I was 15 way and stuff like that. Um, and my high school boyfriend and I used to work at this hotel out in Loudoun County, Virginia called Lansdowne, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, and he worked in in-room dining and I worked in the buffet fancy restaurant and we used to steal bottles of wine from them and drink them on my like far country house front porch, which is now a townhouse complex <laughs> in Loudoun. And we like started to like wine. And like as high schoolers, we decided that we liked wine and food and would like go out to these restaurants in the, you know, Virginia, DC area. Like I remember driving out to one that used to be out towards Washington, Virginia called four and 20 blackbirds. Oh yeah. If you may remember, that's like where we went for dinner when I was like a junior in high school for Valentine's day, you know? Yeah, and, okay. and, and Yeah. And we couldn't drink wine then, but we were both, you know, because we were in a restaurant, we were high schoolers, but we were like, into like what was going on um and the kind of ebb and flow of my life you know brought me like into places where you wouldn't even be exposed to wine at all but anytime I was somewhere where I could be exposed to wine I wanted to learn and ask everything and then it kind of all crescendoed in Berkeley in around 2006 I was working at a um at like a beer bar, like a random beer bar. And um, this like very handsome young guy came in and he ordered some beer and it was like, I was getting off and he went and sat outside and was smoking a cigarette. And I went up and, you know, bummed a cigarette to talk to him or something. And I was like, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a winemaker. And it was just like, <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> Um, so the trajectory kind of began there. And again, it was like an ebb and flow of I went and traveled in Asia for a while and learned that like, you know, the tribalism of being involved in subcultures wasn't what I wanted out of my life. And then, you know, I came Although back. I, I will say ironically, winemaking is very much a subculture of, of its own. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But it's, um, I would say it's less it's less like tribalist than, you know, basically what I'm saying is like, like how, le leaving, you know, for all intents and purposes, how I grew up, like, and, um, and stepping out into the big world, you know, even though backpacking through Nepal isn't a wine culture extravaganza, I had to like learn to become with fr like friends with people who I had nothing in common with or that I thought I had nothing in common with because they didn't like the same bands you know or something <laughs> like that but it's um it was just like a wide-eyed opening moment in in my life and then I ended up coming back to the Bay Area for a little bit. I never actually was a tattoo artist. I only apprenticed. Oh, but, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize. It's okay. It's okay. People, <laughs> listen, that's like the one, I think it's because I have a lot of tattoos, which I got when I was like 18 and 19 um, in DC. Uh, and, um, but back in the Bay Area, I then just got more and more interested in wine and finally was like, I'm going to Spain and I'm going to ride my bike into France and learn to make wine. And I got to Barcelona with like $2,000 and like a four month round trip, which was not enough money uh, to ride my bike into France and learn to make wine. And I ended up staying in Barcelona and then getting more into food and wine and eventually coming back to California and learning to make wine here. But with no credible experience, my resume was laughable so, <laughs> but I, I love I love that that didn't stop you, and and I I think you know you you have this like uh, force of nature quality about you that um, you know for you know the mass of men that you know are more easily dissuaded um, is is really you know amazing and inspirational, um, and uh, I read that actually the or I, I heard on a podcast that um, Cab Franc was the first uh, wine that you made. Yes. Um... 
Sorry, I, if I if I get off topic, you just steer oh, no me and I will. Uh, so Cabernet Franc, um, even to this day, uh, you know, when we close our eyes and we imagine our like memory house, like like the foyer of smell and wine for me is Cabernet Franc. Like when I stick my like I'm getting chills even thinking about <laughs> a glass of Cabernet Franc and like that. Parazine that's like not bell pepper like you can get with underripe Carminera Merlot, but it's like that parazine that's like pea tendril and like carrot top and like kind of like good green smells. And then the petrichor, you know, like the wet earth smell and, and the bloodiness that can be there and the kind of like brambly berry and everything. Like that is what I love about red wine. And Cabernet Franc, when executed properly, you can just build all of those things into one wine and it can be a you know a I wouldn't say a big wine but I mean there are wines from Chinon and Samour that are not small wines they also have Cabernet Sauvignon in them um, but the typicity is Cabernet Franc um, but then the flip side of that is there's plenty of like beautiful Vend de Table which is more like the La La Lu Cabernet Franc that you guys are drinking um, um, but the first wine I ever made it was a Cabernet Franc uh, from Carneros, which uh, Sonoma Carneros is an excellent um, growing region for Bordeaux varietals. I don't know why it's full of Pinot Noir. It drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> and, but that was a, that was a more, I would say like more Chinon style, you know, as where this is to me, like kind of like a, like La Metable, almost like it'd be more in the, like the Bourgoy kind of realm. Cool. You know, a little warmer. Now, for those of you that, you know, kind of think of a winemaker as somebody that, you know, has more money than God and owns their land and owns a farm and all the, you know, means of production, um, you know, how is your mode of operating, you know, kind of different than that? Um, well, when I started making wine, um, the, uh, the same guy that I had walked up to in, um, in the beer bar, you know, in 2006, uh, we stayed friends. He's actually, he's an Orthodox kosher winemaker um, for Covenant. Is that the Jonathan Hadju? Yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. that's exactly who, he, he's still one of my best friends. Awesome. Um, but Jonathan's one of the people who like, like the first time I understood what an Appalachian was or a wine region or different varieties, like I learned all that from Jonathan very early. Um, but he, um, Basically, after I, I worked at Vintage in 2011 at Unti, and then in 2012, he knew I wanted to make wine, and I didn't have any money. I mean, I was on, like, Medi-Cal and food stamps, you know, trying to figure out how to have a life where I could actually do something meaningful in California, where it's really fucking expensive, pardon me. But, like, you know, and I was in you school. Can, you can drop it. You can, it's F-bomb friendly. It's, it's okay. okay. You, can drop a, you can punctuate things with the occasional F-bomb, yeah. But like working a million jobs and, you know, Jonathan was like, you should make wine this vintage. And I was like, Jonathan, I, I don't, I don't have any fruit. And he's like, I'll buy you some Cab Franc. Cause he knew that's what I wanted. He's like, we'll find you some Cab Franc. I'll buy you some Cab Franc. And I was like, Jonathan, I don't have anywhere to make my wine. And he's like, do it in my cellar. And I was like, I don't even have a barrel. And he's like, if don't just stop making excuses. Like I will get you your half ton of Cab Franc. I will get you a barrel. You can do it in my cellar. Like you're making wine this year, and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really like the you know I had no capital, and then it was basically from 2012 through 2014. I just worked my ass off, and you know worked for wine distributors, ran a wine bar, worked for another winemaker. I worked with Matthiasen for a while, and Steve's kind of been like my fairy godfather in winemaking as well Stephen Jonathan. I didn't, I didn't realize that he's also kind of a punk rock kid like uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one of the you would never guess that about him like I, he doesn't he doesn't necessarily like you know fit that uh he looks cleaner cut we were both bike messengers too oh uh, yeah, right he's in San Francisco <laughs> you know he was in San Francisco I was in DC oh, but, cool. but yeah no but that was like I, I remember the first time I went out to meet Steve because I had like briefly met him at a tasting and just driving in a car and having a conversation with him about Petrichor. And like, we still <laughs> sometimes if one of us read an article now about Petrichor that's interesting, geek out about it together. 
but I also like he immediately saw that like I wanted to learn but I was also trying to make something and that I you know wasn't California pedigree wine person or like a tech dude who had millions of dollars you know and he just kind of like was always there when I had questions and the day I realized he was a punk rocker was when I gave him the gate code to um, a vineyard that I was farming to make some of my wine and he was like oh like the punk band 999 and I was like ah <laughs> and that's, you know and that's a pretty like obscure cut too you know? <laughs> and and so for the uninitiated, petrichor is one of my favorite uh, tasting notes of all time. It refers to the smell of earth, the smell of pavement um, after rain. And there's a lot of actually like academic inquiry into it now because um, uh, it's thought that uh, it essentially, um, you know, those smells are always there and the rain volatilizes a lot of odors that are already present in the earth. And if you are a smell junkie, I think, you know, it's something that, you know, is really visceral for you. And, and I think if you love smells, you don't really like, you know, discriminate between good and bad. It's just, they're all like really interesting to you. And, and Petrichor is one of those that like, um, is, is really, you know, evocative, especially, you know, if you're, you know, living on the land and there's dirt roads everywhere and stuff like that. And, you know, I think when it emerges in, in wine, it's like this aha, you know, kind of, you know, tuning fork, you know, short, short circuit the brain kind of uh, moments. Um, for the sake of your cab franc here, which, you know, we have an adorable cardboard cutout, which is really pathetic. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so so I, I didn't know what was going on when I first saw it. <laughs> well, come on, we, we, need, we need an exemplar. I'm like the worst Van White ever. Um, <laughs> so how, tell us how this one uh, is made. So you were, yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. Uh, you, you called it a bond de swap. How do you, how do you make it? So it's, it's free um, sorry. So that the you have the you guys have the 19, so that's from yeah. a few different vineyards. Um, one being a certified organic vineyard, and then the other uh, two are not certified, but they're farmed without uh, conventional pesticides or herbicides. So I'm trying to I'm looking at this map. So you're in Clarksburg, right? It's a so that's actually mostly I would say it's about 50% Contra Costa, 25 Clarksburg, 25 Sierra Foothills. Cool. So the the kind of lighter style, like part of that wine comes from um, Contra Costa, which is like just above Oakland. I'm looking at your map too and seeing if I can like give you a, a good old hone in. Um, yeah, okay, so Contra Costa, like look at the San Francisco Bay Concord and then down is Contra Costa, but like, yeah, the way that the, the way that I so I lived in Berkeley. So the way that I would get into that vineyard is I would be up in Berkeley. And I would drive through the La Marinda. And then it's like at the tip of where Contra Costa like like kind of is it's not it's it's like more in the in the northern part of what would be Contra Costa, where you get a pretty massive wind that comes in from the San Pablo Bay. So it like blows down, like where Richmond is, it's like east of that. Um, and because of that area, it's very sandy soils. It's, you know, a lot of clay loam. Some people dry farm there. Most people should dry farm, but everybody's afraid of that in California and reasonably so. Um, and the water table's high and you can get like, like people have higher yield, lighter wine from there usually, unless they're like over extracting something because it's, it's almost like an island wine. So to me, it's like you either pick really early and you have this like light, fun, bright kind of juicy wine or like, like Bedrock, for example, is a winery that works with fruit from there, but they let it hang for a long time and have a more dense wine. Um, and then up um, north of there, the exactly the Delta Breeze also blows up into I just, Clarksburg. I like that phrase. Delta Breeze just feels like a it's like a soap or a deodorant <laughs> or something on those lines. Like <laughs> yep. I uh, so I call um, Clarksburg Loire Cali as like a stupid little joke. Um, it's warmer than the Loire, but it is a lot of old decomposed river soils. So there's a lot of decomposed granite, alluvial soil. And I think you get some of the, like the Shannon I make from Clarksburg, I think has some of those same kind of like wet earth 
granite flavors um, and that comes through in the Cab Franc. And then there's like a tiny, like more structured backbone. And that is from a vineyard up in the Sierra foothills. That's like all decomposed granite, like CCOF no-till. Um, and the wine has a bit more structure there. So it's a combination of three parts, which is very common in like a Vanda Tadler village wine. Um, and it's just, the, the, but the point of that wine, when I go to make that wine, I want to make something that's just like, light and thirst quenchable that you want with a little bit of a chill. You can have it with your meal or you can just drink a glass of it by itself or with a little charcuterie or, you know, pickles or whatever your thing is. And the wine's just going to be a nice backbone to what's going on. Like it's not um, a wine that's supposed to be like, you know, a like electric yellow jumpsuit. It's more of like a, you know, just like a, I don't know, like a cornflower blue room, you know, sorry, like a safe space or, uh... <laughs> um, I, uh, that's fine. I, I, I won't go into it, but I had a very interesting conversation the other day about that term. And to, I actually find that term important and it's like, like, oh, right. yes, to me, it would, it would be kind of like a, like a taste safe space, you know, yeah, like where yeah. it's just, by most people's palate that wine will just be something where it's like this is nice yeah. Yeah. and i think there's not enough wine at least in california that like tries to be in that place i feel like there's a lot of statement making that happens well it's just this like kind of classic old world you know fabric of the table you know work a day wine that is you know something you know that's not um, you know, one dimensional, um, but something that's wildly thirst quenching that you would, you know, never get tired of drinking. Um, and, you know, it's very much of a moment. And, you know, there are a lot of different French terms for that. You know, Vendre Soir, Vendre Glacier, they say Blue Blue. So, you know, I think anytime, a, you know, a language has a lot of different words for something that reflects, you know, the value that they, they put on it. And, um, you know, I love that that's something that the, I I the French value. Um, so do we have any questions for, for Laura um, or any tasting notes uh, from the commentary uh, on, on her wine for those uh, that do not have it uh, in the midst? Um, I will say, you know, what I love about, you know, this style of kind of like Cali, um, you know, Vendée Tab is that you get this like fullness of fruit, this ripeness coupled with this like really bright acidity um, that's, you know, very different than the old world, but in the spirit of. Um, and I think, uh, you know, this, this Cap Franc, especially in this vintage, really embodies that. Um, Kristen and David, I do like blending Cabernet. Like I do like, like I like blending period. Um, I very seldom have a wine that goes into bottle that's actually just a mono varietal wine. Um, it's always a tiny bit and I don't, I mean, people feel differently about this, but to me, it's just like, if you're just adding a little salt or pepper to something, like I don't feel like it's, changing the whole dynamic it's not, a, it's not a steak you know it doesn't cease to be a steak if you season it yes exactly and i think that that's um you know that again like in in the old world it's very common to just blend a tiny bit of something into something to amplify um the qualities that you want so i do almost always blend a tiny bit of cabernet sauvignon into cabernet franc oh interesting um, and that like that wine even has like I don't know, probably 5% Cabernet Sauvignon from Clarksburg. Oh, cool. Um, and, and I find that that just kind of, I don't know, like it just adds this little element of structure in it. Um, and then interestingly, on the flip side, I like blending Cabernet Franc in a small amount with Merlot. Like with Merlot, I would want to blend a tiny bit of Cab Sauv and a tiny bit of Cab Franc. It just, you just get a different, like the wine just expresses itself in, in a nicer way that way. But um, that was the, the question I saw also interest. You're much, you're much better at, uh, you know, chewing gum and walking than I am. Uh, I, I struggle, I struggle with the, the chat while we, while we talk, but. Uh, oh, so like, this is, I, I like very not a good reader, but. Uh. <laughs> um, oh, all right. So uh, Laura, we're going to, we're going to taste through um, some different exemplars here and uh, feel free to please weigh in. We're going to come back to you. I want to, you know, talk a little more about, you know, 
um, you know, your branding and, you know, some, some other things that came up in the context of, you know, diving deeper into your, um, you know, uh, career as a, as a winemaker in California, but I uh, want to talk to about these different manifestations of, of Cab Franc. And we're going to move from a California Vendée Placier to a cool climate, uh, <laughs> Cabernet, uh, from uh, the Finger Lakes. Uh, I fucking love the Finger Lakes. Um, as you all uh, know, um, we've already dedicated a class to the Finger Lakes. Uh, Cab Franc has become their kind of signature uh, red varietal. Have you tried any uh, Cabernet Franc out of the Finger Lakes, Laura? I have, but it's been a long time and I can't speak to the producer. Okay. Um, there's one that called Calden or something. There's one with like a brown label. Oh, that I I've had it. It, it, but I, I like them. I just haven't had a lot. Well, no, and, and uh, I, I talked to those winemakers about the difficulty of, of showing their wines on the West Coast and a lot of them, you know, it can be a challenging market to break into. Oh, for uh, sure. Um, so, uh, the Finger Lakes um, is, you know, kind of an unlikely place for Cab Franc, but Cab Franc is a very hardy vine. Uh, it has very thick um, kind of bud wood, um, so it thrives in a cooler climate. You can see the, the aforementioned lakes here. I love this image because you see uh, the Finger Lakes in the snow and you get a sense of, you know, this uh, thin strip of land on either side of the lakes, the biggest of which is Seneca Lake, um, on which is located the uh, vineyards for the sake of uh, the wine, um, those of you that have the ravines are drinking, uh, so Morton Halgren and his wife, Lisa. Uh, he's a Dane who cut his teeth at Codesternel um, at his family's estate in Provence, uh, but decamped to uh, the Finger Lakes to make wine, um, you know, in the new world, uh, in his own image, works with Riesling and Cab Franc. And um, Cab Franc, very cold, cold hardy. Um, in this corner of the world, they're harvesting about a month later than they would in a place like Virginia and, you know, probably a month and a half or, you know, later than they do. Um, on the on the west coast. Uh, this comes from multiple vineyard sites, one of which um, is kind of more limestone heavy on the northwest corner of the lake, the other which, um, you know, is even more limestone heavy on the, on the southwest uh, edge of the lake. Um, uh, it sees time in large um, neutral oak, about 600 um, gallon uh, uh, large oak. Um, not entirely neutral, I think, you know, they just purchased the barrel, so um, they haven't used it enough that it's fully uh, neutral uh, as of yet, but uh, you know, they find that, um, you know, Cab Franc uh, in this environment needs kind of a uh, more gentler, uh, you know, a, a more gentle hand uh, in uh, the, the cellar. They don't want an overt uh, new oak influence because that would overwhelm uh, the wine. And I love the tart fruit quality of this one. Um, I find, you know, Cab Franc in these cooler climes can take on this really awesome earthy, herbaceous, you know, almost medicinal, but not in a bad way. Uh, kind of character uh, that this one embodies um, and it is definitely like long and lean and super bright. Um, have another wine from Early Mountain um, out of uh, Virginia here and you know we're going from kind of cooler climates to progressively warmer ones and uh, Virginia doesn't make um, you know uh, you know a lot of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon or good Cabernet Sauvignon that's because Cab Sauv wants its feet dry but Cab Franc uh, does really well in cooler uh, damper environments. Um, Laura, have you had a chance to hit the Virginia wine trail at all? <laughs> no, but I mean that, again, that like as soon as I can travel again, I actually really want to. Um, I've been hearing some cool stuff and then I had the one, the wines from the guys in DC that you turned me on to and they really, they're, they're very exciting wines to me. And I mean, being from DC, Virginia, I'm, <laughs> I, I just, I, I'm fascinated. So it's, um, it's, it's something I really want to do anyway. And when that, when I do that, I will ask you for many. Oh, yeah, no worries. So this is actually, so you had the Lightwell survey, um, the, uh, Pete Mansing, um, and Riesling blend. Um, and this is from the same winemaker, but this is basically his day job. Um, so he does that as a side project. Um, okay. I feel like, I feel like winemakers are kind of like musicians that way, like their side projects have side projects, but, um, this is his steady job. Um, like a session musician gig uh, for Early Mountain, which is owned a historic property owned by um, uh, Steve uh, Case uh, and his wife, um, you know, and, and they have, you know, quite a bit of money pour into it. They have that like crazy AOL money. Um, this is from two different uh, sites in the Shenandoah Valley. And what I really dig about it is, um, you know, it is, it is lusher, it's more luxuriant. Um, I think, you know, the quality of fruit is much more velvety um, than the Finger Lakes offering. And I think it's really fun to juxtapose um, you know, one against the other uh, for the sake of these two, um, you know, but nonetheless, um, you know, it, it still, you know, reflects the character of a cooler climate. Um, it doesn't really have any tannins to speak of, you know, the fruit, the fruit is, you know, kind of 
broader uh, and riper um, and darker in character than you'd expect on the Finger Lakes wine. Um, you know, but again, there's not a huge new overt uh, um, oak influence. Um, they save that for, you know, some of their more like prestige cuvées, um, you know, but, you know, there's, for me, Cap Bronc, when you hit it right, um, just has this like really like um, gorgeous texture. Um, you know, it's not devoid of tannins, but um, they're really soft and, you know, enveloping uh, in, in a wonderful way. And then uh, the last um, wine as part of our New World flight, kind of working backwards, is from Ungrafted Vines in Chile. Um, Chile is a land without phylloxera um, and uh, has some of the oldest ungrafted vines in the world. It's from uh, Garage Wine Company. Um, I'm going to pull up a um, proper image of Derek Mossman, who does the winemaking, but 110 year old ungrafted vines, dry farmed. Um, it's a hard place to dry farm. It's an act of faith, a leap of faith, much like it is um, in uh, California. But uh, Cap Bronx is really well there. That said, it's much riper, kind of chewier style. Um, then, uh, you know, you're likely to encounter certainly then the East Coast has a lot more in common with um, what you find uh, predominantly in California. Um, uh, you know, how would you, being on the West Coast floor, how would you kind of classify, you know, obviously Cab Sauv is the, you know, kind of um, bell of the ball there uh, on the, you know, red grape side of, of the world. But, you know, people who are working with Cap Franc, you know, what stylistically, what are most of those like? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of variation, um, you know, like the big Napa producers basically try to make Cab Sauv the same way they'd make, or make Cab Franc the same way they'd make Cab Sauv. Um, and I mean, it sounds like the Matthiasen Cab, or Cab Franc is one that you have in this lineup. Like, I think Steve is kind of more in the wheelhouse of like what I love about Cab Sauv. Brock Sellers has made a really pretty Cab Franc in the back. Because you're Berkeley neighbors. Sorry? Your Berkeley neighbors. Yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, I think that California is still very much the Wild West as far as uh, wine style. Um, so you really get the whole spectrum. Um, I think that the thing that the big delineation between New World wine and Old World wine for me, like, and I don't have a large um, diction for like, like a Chilean Cap Franc. I've probably come across one along the way, but I don't, I can't tell you what that would taste like. Um, I think that a lot of times it's warmer in new world climates and um, there is less acidity. Um, and that can, to me, create like a, I don't know, just like a complicated formulation in the wine where people will then try and do the same techniques that they would in Europe, like stem inclusion and stuff like that. And sometimes you end up with a wine that doesn't, like it just kind of doesn't, it doesn't flow necessarily. So sometimes I'll get that in New World wines. If, you know, I know that Steve actually does do a small amount of stem inclusion in his Cab Franc, but he picks it early enough that it works. Um, so there's just kind of like a whole spectrum of what you're going to get in the new world like I'm up in so I have 20 acres of vine on Underwood Mountain in Washington now which is like cold dry farmed there's like three feet of snow there right now and I'm planning on planting Cab Franc up there too and I think it's going to be fine it's just going to be really different you know but, you find yourself getting frustrated with you know your California neighbors that treat Cab Franc like they would Cab Sauv? Do you, you know, want to shout at them like, you know, stop, you know, that's not, you know, what you're dealing with here? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that the same people who are doing that are making Cab Sauv, not the way that I, like, I make a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon too. I actually may make more Cab Sauv if I added it up. It's either Cab or Merlot that I make more of. Um, but I think that's just like an overall style discrepancy. And I think that that style can work better on Cabernet Sauvignon because you can get more extraction, you can get more color and tannin and character while still maintaining some acidity. But in Cabernet Franc, it's like once it blows its acid, it kind of like, it doesn't have all of the dimensions that you would need to have like- a yeah, really so it, just, it just kind of falls apart. Exactly. Yeah. And then when you yeah. try and make that into a big wine, it's just like- mm. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, you, or you try to, you know, uh, throw new oak at it or, or whatever. Yeah. It, it just ceases to be what it was in the first place. And still you just miss a big part of the palette. And the funny thing is, is I actually feel like 
the kind of new school of wine that tries to make Cab Franc more in the like classic style where they do a ton of stem inclusion and stuff like that, like they create the same problem. It's just not as big of a problem because there's not a ton of new oak and extraction and stuff happening too. But uh, where the wine kind of misses like uh, the mid palate. Brilliant. Uh, so now we're going to take, I'm irrationally excited for the next uh, Old World lineup. Zoe, um, uh, let, do we have any questions about uh, the New World offerings we just tasted through? Um, yeah, we have a ton of questions, um, mainly about you, Laura. I think everyone just wants to know your whole life story because um, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, we, we heard a rumor that you were involved in some spoken word um, poetry in Barcelona, and we were wondering if you could elaborate on that. Um, and uh, also, um, what um, made the decision for you to go to California instead of uh, going to France or making wine around the DMV area? So I, when I lived in Barcelona, I was part of um, a poetry project called the Prostiblo Poetico, which was like a branch of the poetry brothel in New York. Um, and it wasn't as much spoken word as it, it was like a poetry cabaret. Oh, cool. Uh, so I did that. Um, and then I, I also play music. So I would like play music as part of that cabaret. Like I play guitar and sing, and then I would play like experimental shows as well. Um, so that was a big part of like what I did um, over there. Um, I also taught English um, and like created this hustle where I taught English to chefs and I'd like meet them <laughs> in the area and like hang out at Pinocho and like eat cigarettes <laughs> and you know drink sherry and then we'd walk around the market and talk about food. Um, so I mean I kind of I was like I had a bit of like a vagabond life when I was over there. I mean, I did, I was you're, engaged. You were a hustler. You were like a little bit of a hustler. Uh. <laughs> well, I, it, the reason I stayed was I met a Catalan guy who, you know, we fell madly in love and like got engaged within a week. And he was really into food and wine too. So when we were together, we ate out and drank a lot of wine. And um, I mean, the real reason I decided to go back to the U.S. versus, um, versus staying over there was because I was undocumented. And <laughs> <laughs> so I, I might have stuck around longer. I mean, it was also hard because I didn't have a lot of money. And like, I did have a kid when I was very young and she and I are still very close and like getting to like, you know, like getting to spend as much time with her as I wanted living overseas would have been really hard. Um, but it was, it was a wonderful experience to be over there. Um, I mean, I learned I think that I learned more about food than anything else, but I think to be a good winemaker, like you have to understand the principles of like beautiful, simple food. Um, but yeah, the, po the poetry stuff was fun. <laughs> I still- and What I took you to California? Sorry? Um, what took you to California? Uh, so that was where I had lived in California prior um, and I was able to get an internship there. So I basically wrote this resume that was absolutely full of lies. Um, embellished, come on, it was embellished. Embe well, yes, that's <laughs> usually the word I use, but um, it was embellished tremendously. Um, and I sent it to a bunch of different wineries that I had like no business applying for. And um, I, um, I heard back from a few because the main thing is I wrote a cover letter and my cover letter was like to me wine is like a confluence of like uh you know science and art and alchemy and blah 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 blah. and you know it said that I was a poet and all this stuff and a few people like from actually very credible wineries got back to me I was written back by Chateau Montalena oh, okay, um, sure. the uh, Oren Swift guys who do the prisoner um <laughs> and then, and then uh, Unti, which was like an organic biodynamic small winery. That and, works uh, predominantly with uh, Italian varietals. Yep, exactly. Yeah. But they, they had a French winemaker who was really cool. And like, I went out there, like I flew back because basically, you know, I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to be able to get a job. And I went and met him and like, he didn't tell me it was very clear that I didn't know what I was doing but I could just tell like he was kind of like anytime I like started to be like wine 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 he was like yeah whatever okay anyway like <laughs> um but we've stayed friends too and um I think maybe a year and a half ago or something we were having lunch and laughing about my resume and he's like yeah the only reason I gave you a job was because you're a poet <laughs> Uh, so this is a, the, the quotable Laura Brennan Bissell. I was actually going to read this to start, start the lesson, but this is 
uh, straight off your, uh, your website bio. The truth yeah. about winemaking is that it embodies and emboldens all your senses. And while it's invigorating the smell and taste of vintage, and even see the color expressed as a rosy prism before you, to be able to hear the wind inside your head and remember the smell of what the previous year's precipitation promised is when it becomes a form of synesthetic life support. Uh, synesthetic life support. I, I, I love I love that. that. I mean, I feel like that could be a punk band. Synesthetic <laughs> life support. Like, we are! <laughs> no, it's like kind of like a coil. Like yeah, yeah. Our first our first track is Vin de Soie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, without, without further ado, we're going to taste through these. I promise time for more questions. Um, and I want to, so a uh, provocative question. Um, so we're going to consider uh, uh, where you see yourself uh, sitting uh, in, you know, the modern wine um, middle age uh, cafeteria. You know, are you with like the hip uh, natty wine kids? Are you at your own table? You know, who's are you? Are you flitting between tables? You know, what what is the uh, you know what is the the relationship there? Because we have uh, three of my favorite wines, and these are from the Loire Valley. I'm going to pull up an image. Uh, this is a flashback, first of all, to uh, the wine that we just tasted. So um, this is an own rooted vine. Uh, it's not kept from, but uh, that uh, um, uh, this gentleman, uh, Mossman, uh, works with uh, in Chile. Um, he uh, makes the Garage Wine Company wines. I just love these vines. Um, you know, they look like old olive trees. They have this like force of personality that's just fucking amazing. Um, and uh, really special thing, own rooted vines, uh, because we're going to move uh, next into a wine that is own rooted, uh, that comes from uh, Master of the Arts, uh, Thierry Germain, uh, who is a, a huge advocate of biodynamic farming, about as um, forceful an advocate as anyone outside of Nicolas Choli or Rudolf Scheiner. And well, Till. Yeah. Oh, and Until. Awesome. Gangster. Uh, we've actually. Uh, talked extensively about no-till uh, on this podcast uh, or whatever the hell this thing is at this point, but- um, Yeah, me and Mimi uh, Castile are really close. Uh, oh, awesome. Um, and uh, we, uh, Melanie Fister, uh, who's an amazing uh, female winemaker out of uh, Northern Alsace, uh, is a fierce uh, advocate of no-till too. Um, I actually poured next, like, I, I'm pretty sure I, I've met her as well. Like, she I mean, is awesome. Um, uh, Zoe, <laughs> Zoe actually has uh, um, used her, uh, snippets of her podcast as her ringtone uh, now for uh, which I feel like I don't know how Melanie would feel about that or uh, but anyway she's uh, she figures if, if it's who, she, she's into poetry well right uh, I wouldn't surprise me if she it wouldn't surprise me if she is um, uh, she's she's a, a just an amazing an amazing woman but uh, at any rate I need to pull up a map of the Loire Valley uh, because you need to situate yourselves uh, we're dealing with the three most important designations of origin um, pretty much in France for uh, Cab Franc uh, based varietal wines. We're going to begin in Summer Champagne, which is in red here, move on to uh, Bergay, uh, which is one of the most uh, vexing uh, French words pronounced ever. Uh, my French is bollocks. It's pronounced Bergay. It's like one of those that just kind of gets lost in your throat and becomes something else. I apologize to the native French speakers uh, in the mix here. Um, that's how I say it. Um, you know, I do the best that I can. Uh, Spanish was my second language, and then Chino. Um, and Ogorfo, um, uh, which is just like timeless. Um, at any rate, um, uh, you're in the kind of part of the Loire Valley. Um, this is uh, Chateau country. Um, the characteristic mother rock is Troupeau Jean, which is a yellow, um, uh, very kind of like uh, uh, fragile uh, limestone heavy, um, like uh, sedimentary rock. Um, uh, retains water really well, um, gives structured wines. Um, they're basically two primary soil types. You have wines uh, derived from this Troupeau Jean, um, and then you have uh, wines derived from uh, sandier soils closer to the river. Um, Summer Chimpani tends to produce um, the most kind of uh, uh, broad uh, wines. Uh, it's warmer, it sees a little more rainfall uh, than Chinon, uh, which itself is warmer as well on the southern bank of the Loire. Uh, Bergay, the coolest uh, and probably the wettest of the bunch, produces the most kind of brooding, um, you know, uh, Lord Byron. Uh, anti-hero uh, Luke Perry uh, kind of wines uh, in, in the mix uh, for the sake of, of these offerings. Um, that is, uh, you know, what we're dealing with here. Um, uh, the Thierry Germain is Franc de Pied, uh, which is to say it's uh, own rooted vines. Um, uh, that's very special um, because uh, most of the vines in the old world are grafted um, because uh, of the phylloxera louse, which spread its way from the lower Mississippi Valley to England because English um, love to pluck plants from everywhere and plant them in the greenhouses and then, you know, bada bing, bada boom, uh, you find your way to Bordeaux and everyone is, you know, feeling like they're living in the midst of, um, you know, the end times. Uh, but um, 
there are a few uh, fearless, uh, brave souls like Thierry Germain um, who uh, continue to plant own rooted vines and uh, give something special to the wines. I I've heard it's said that it makes for kind of a more savory wine that, you know, regulates its nutrient flows to uh, the fruits in a, a much more poetic uh, and, and profound and expressive way uh, than is capable with the grafting wound. Um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to isolate um, grafted, ungrafted as a independent variable for the sake of tasting, just to say it's pretty much impossible. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working, you know, as much with myth as we are um, with the scientific understanding of wine tasting. That said, you know, the wines I, I've tasted from ungrafted vines, I, I found have this, you know, um, more expressive streak, higher acid and, and slightly lower alcohol, um, uh, you know, across the board. And I find that to be the case with this one. Um, that said, it's on sandy soils, which tends to give breadth to wines and an expressive fruitiness. Um, this wine is showing stupidly well as a 2014. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's gangbusters. I, I really adore it. Um, and then the, um, the Burgai here, um, it comes from, uh, 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 Gal oh, sorry, um, Galachet is a single vineyard. Um, to pull up my notes, um, I've for forgotten. Castelo, Pierre Castelo uh, family, which dates back to 1640. Um, this one is not unrooted, uh, or, or uh, self-rooted rather, um, traditionally grafted vines, but 50 plus years old, um, uh, harder uh, mother rock, uh, deeper soils, but more limestone across the river in Burgai. Um, the cellars are like picture book here. Um, if you want to get a sense of, you know, what the middle Loire is, um, this is the, the cellar um, uh, at uh, uh, Domaine uh, de la Chevière. Um, and, you know, you can see the, the rock, the Tupojon, um, that the very vines uh, above our heads are planted on, uh, into which the cellars themselves uh, are dug poetically. And uh, when um, uh, the proprietor of this estate, um, Pierre used to, he passed away, sadly, his, his three children are taking over the domain, but he used to say, welcome to paradise, when he uh, descended um, the, the winery stairs, which I thought was, was super badass. And then uh, this last one, um, is 2004, which is not a celebrated vintage, but it is showing stupidly well. Um, I had to bring it in kind of through the gray market. Um, this is Ogre Refaux's wine. Um, there should be a Hollywood biopic about Ogre Refaux. This is Olga. Her husband passed away in 1947. Um, she never made the wine. She um, basically um, kept the estate alive in the very difficult uh, post-war period. She did so with the support of a former German soldier who found his way to the winery in the waning days of World War II. Olga's husband passed away in uh, 1947. And the legend goes that on his deathbed, uh, the German gentleman who had been working with him at the end of the war, uh, uh, and his name uh, uh, was uh, very, very Germanic in and of its own way, uh, but Ernest Zenninger. Uh, this is the only photograph I could find of him. It looks super sketchy. It looks like he's like a post-war criminal or something. Very much not, um, you know, a, um, you know, going to be, you know, kind of, you know, withheld for war crimes. Um, the opposite of it. Like, this is one of those great stories that speaks to the way that people can come together, um, you know, in spite of, um, you know, uh, you know, war and, you know, all the political forces that pulled us apart. Um, and uh, Ernest, um, for uh, the better part of Olga's lifetime, um, helped her sustain uh, the winery, make the wines. Um, uh, through the current day, um, uh, Olga's uh, granddaughter um, now uh, running the roost uh, with her husband um, and uh, they're, you know, fabulous people. But um, I, this comes from a, a vineyard called Le Picasse. Um, it is the thinnest soils, the most structured. Um, it's a miracle of a wine uh, for a grape that turns out relatively uh, light offerings, structured, profound um, for 2004 that was in half bottles, mind you. Um, stupidly long, um, you know, stupidly young, apparently still from a problematic vintage in 2004, um, and, you know, truly a signpost of greatness for uh, this grape and an Appalachian in Chinon, um, just as gorgeous as it is. Um, all of which is to say that um, these are wines that are made essentially in the same way. Native yeast, um, they are aged in neutral oak, um, uh, and then they are bottled with a uh, very small, but, you know, not insignificant addition of sulfur. I would consider these very natural wines, um, uh, but uh, there are a lot of people that uh, you know wouldn't consider them as such. Where do you land after that? You know, long discourse, uh, Laura. Uh, for the sake of you know this whole natural wine debate, um, I 
hate to be the person to say this, um, but Ruffo is not organic. Um, I it doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. I love those wines. I I have respect like to the umpt like matter of fact, if I was at a cafeteria table of people, I would want to like I know this is maybe like shooting the moon, but like I'd want to be <laughs> with like Lalu Bislerwa and Olga Raffo and like some of these like baller ladies that have been behind some of the best wines ever made. Um, there could be a couple dudes there, but like <laughs> me am wearing an all black like cashmere sweater and a nice like vintage Hermes scarf. What, and what, uh, what's your footwear like? Are you wearing like docks or what's the... Uh... Oh, footwear? Yeah. Oh, if we're, if we're, um, you know, if we're like just having lunch, like I'm, I'm wearing some nice shoes. Like, oh, nicer like, shoes. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wear, I, in the, so I, um, I'm also like a giant, like I'm like a really big nerd about uh, mobility and I power lift and stuff like that. So my vineyard shoes are actually not that cool. Like I wear, um, I wear ultras a lot. <laughs> Um, so I have like waterproof, like ugly hiking ultra boots. So you're, you're, the footwear would be practical. It would be. I mean, <laughs> I used to wear like the Blundstones and the Rossies and all that stuff, but now I just I'm more worried about like my toes being mobile. Um, but um, but I still will wear some some nice nice shoes and even break out a pair of heels every once in a while if, uh, if oh, it's nice. time to look good. Um, yeah. So as far as the natural wine stuff. Um, I don't care. Um, <laughs> I, I believe uh, I believe that the best wines in the world have been made under the principles of what I was introduced as natural wine in the beginning, which is organically farmed, uh, low intervention in the cellar, um, and I'm not afraid of sulfur. Um, I actually think that like a lot of like as a winemaker, I kind of came to this on my own and I have been told that this is very common in other cellars um, of other people who don't care about the term natural wine, but probably make what could be considered natural wine. Uh, I sulfur after mallow instead of a bottling. I think that sulf sulfuring only a bottling is actually limiting your controls. I, I've heard, um, I heard that a lot. And actually I, I encountered that with a lot of Georgian winemakers I work with who yeah. will sulfur after mallow um, before a longer elevage on the skins yeah, uh, just yeah. to ward mm -hmm. off a, yeah exactly or you like like what i typically do is it's like a 20 ppm sulfuric crush by the time that fermentation is over there's no sulfur left you can't even test for it it's all blown off and then i sulfur again after mallow and it's like a very small addition you know 22 parts and then i typically can bottle like my earlier ones like that wine maybe has 20 total probably I bottled with around three free or something really low. Yes. <laughs> but um, I, I think like, I'm just now the sad thing is, is that when I hear people talk about natural wine, I don't even think that they're talking about how it's made. I think they're talking about how it tastes. A flavor profile. Yeah. 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 And that to me is problematic because yeah. it's like that, like, if you like funky kombucha wine, like that's cool, that's fine, drink that wine. But like, I don't understand trying to like have a, a conversation about how that's how wine should be. Cause it's, it's not like there's thousands of years of development of wine and flavor and people working towards beautiful things. And then I think it's, it's kind of like, like to me, natural wine is like Dada art. There's a, few really cool dot artists it's like a, a urinal on the it's the urinal on the like in the gallery of the uh, it's like the marshall de Champs of the uh, yes. yeah. yeah yeah by the by the way uh i did a um a tasting group years back where we um read um god whatever in grundel the rebel book and every time we got together oh. to have a group we we drink cabernet franc oh, but nice. um, uh, um, uh pantagruel uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah but uh I, yeah, I, I just, the natural wine thing to, like, I'm, I'm an old lady. Like, I, I just don't, I don't care. Like, you're not trying to impress would, anybody anymore. Sorry? You're not trying to impress anybody anymore. You're just. Yeah, uh, and it's funny because I think people think that because I have tattoos and like, I'm, you know, relatively young as a winemaker that I'm going to be this like big natural wine, you know, broadcaster. 
And to me, it's just like radio fuzz about something that I really care about, which is like beautiful structured wine that people dedicate their lives to making. So. Yeah. And, um, you know, on the, on the sulfur question, you know, does it equally horrify you that, you know, something could come to a consumer and be fundamentally flawed if you didn't make those additions, even if it tasted, you know, stupendous in the, in the cellar? Sorry, I, you froze in the middle of that. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. Um, you know, I mean, with, with sulfur, you know, do you feel like it's a necessary evil or do you feel like it's a really important part of the winemaking process that, you know, people should just speak more openly about? Um, I think that it's a really important part of the winemaking process that people should speak more openly about. I think that every once in a while you have a wine that has enough acid um, and you're going to bottle it at a soon enough time that you don't need it. Um, to me, it's like, would you buy mustard that didn't have sulfur in it? Or like, you know, it's like there already. It's like part of the compound of the mustard or like, like, like dried fruit. Like if you didn't put sulfur on dried fruit, like it's going to go bad in a couple of weeks. Um, especially if you put it in a package and that's what sulfur is, is it's a preservative and you use it in a really, you know, it is an elemental thing. Like you use it in a very controlled small amount and it doesn't matter. The, I mean, the, the sulfur argument in the beginning wasn't no sulfur, yes sulfur. It was like, people are using prescriptive amounts of way too much sulfur and it's ruining the terroir and the wine and it's creating a flavor that is the flavor of a very sulfury wine, not the flavor of a wine. And that again is why I think that like when you put it in also matters because you know, like the natural wine prescription is like, oh, 20 to 30 parts at bottling. And it's like, well, when you do that, you shut your wine down. Your wine has never experienced sulfur. If we wanna think of wine as a living thing, why are you going to introduce something that's completely foreign to it at the absolute end right before you shove it in a bottle? I mean, it's like, it's like the wine is going through labor and you just add trauma to it, you know, versus like introducing this thing earlier on to help preserve it and help keep the wine from going volatile or becoming mousy or having, you know, all sorts of other undesirable qualities, Britannomyces, that can grow inside of a wine as it's aging in your cellar or you just add a tiny little bit of sulfur, which is a preservative and helps preserve the wine. And it's like, you're fine. Um, the health side of it, I actually get a rash if I drink wine that has a lot of sulfur in it. Like like some German wines or conventional wines, like yeah. I will, I'm sensitive to it. Oh, like dessert wine? I, sorry? Like dessert wine? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh God, dessert wine and like my face is red and I get a headache. and. I still drink it sometimes though, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I just, I, on offer. you can't, uh, you can't refuse right. to buy. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> That's like really good. Mopalsi, yeah. <laughs> I love it. But, um, it's, it's just this cycling. And I think people like to talk about sulfur because it's the most understandable thing. So people who don't even know a lot about wine can be like, well, what's the sulfur? And I'm like, do you want the free, the total of the molecular motherfucker? Like, what, what do you <laughs> It's just such a silly little, like, well, you know, and, and then the natural wine thing too, unfortunately, a lot of it's just marketing and branding. I mean, everybody thinks Olga Raffo is organic. Everybody thinks that, you know, Pepier Muscadet is organic. They're not. I mean, I love the Dresner portfolio. It's a beautiful portfolio of wine, but because it is like one of the OG natural wine portfolios, everybody just assumes it's organic. And that a lot of producers in particular in California get away with too. Like they just market themselves as this natural winery and they're this natural wine guru and they're doing so good for the world. And like and you pull up the curtains and it's just like. Pfft. And I don't think it diminishes the, you know, Pepier and Raffos of the world to say that they're not organic. You know, they're, they're responding to a very challenging place to make wine in the Loire Valley. And, yeah. you know, I, I think, I think it's important to contextualize things as opposed to making these like, gross generalizations that are dogmatic about what you shouldn't shouldn't be doing in the service of wine. They're also responding to decades and decades of like brainwashing from millions, billions and billions of dollars that, you know, Bayer and Monsanto and other like giant fertilizer companies have been indoctrinating these farmers with. And they're all like, none of them are like trying to give people cancer and do the wrong thing for the earth. You know, they just, are misinformed and misinformation as we all know now takes a long time to shift so um, exactly it does we're we're at ground zero for misinformation here um, <laughs> um yeah. so i want to so we should toast and, and uh, if you if you still have time 
Um, Laura, we'd love to, I'm sure there's some more questions for you, but I wanted to honor um, uh, in the spirit of um, you know, your bravery and making your own wine, uh, one of our, our very own former servers, uh, who's a newly minted assistant winemaker at a uh, local Maryland winery, uh, Rocklands, Allegra Barnes, if you're out there, uh, stopped by earlier today and dropped off her uh, winery's um, Cabernet Franc, uh, and Zoe and I are drinking it right now, and uh, we wanted to toast uh, to you, uh, Allegra. Um, it's so exciting that, you know, our staff has pivoted um, and, you know, found a home on, um, you know, the land. Allegra had a long uh, history in organic farming, but has, you know, kind of dove headlong into winemaking um, in uh, a way that, you know, reminded me a lot of, uh, you know, your uh, career arc, uh, Laura, and uh, it seemed uh, really fitting uh, to toast. So you got Pellegrino there. We always toast um, uh, to everyone at home alone together. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, cheers. That's delightful, Allegra. Um, uh, so what do we have for the sake of questions, uh, additional questions for Laura? Yeah, could we dive a little bit into um, dry farming? Um, we have um, viewers from all different types of levels to maybe go through exactly what it is, and then the pros and cons in particular about dry farming in California. Um, so dry farming is basically letting grapes grow without, at, like without irrigation, be it flood or drip irrigation. Um, so you're adding no water to the farming system and you're just solely dependent on mother nature. Um, I have over the past few years become very radicalized in the like dry farming, you know, no-till regenerative side of agriculture. Um, I, at this point as a winemaker, I'm like actually moving away from a lot of the wines I've even made because I don't feel that they're like, I feel that they can be organic and they can be moving in the right direction, but like, I actually don't feel that they're like that wine in particular in California, I'm sorry to say this is like very environmentally sustainable. Have you chatted up uh, Mimi Castillo at all? Mimi and I are really close buddies. Uh, she, yeah, yeah, she's, yeah, she's the truth. Mimi's been, um, so I moved up to Washington in October, 2019 um, to start a second project up there. Um, and you're in uh, Columbia Gorge? Exactly. Yeah. Right. On the Hillwood Mountains. So I'm 1400 feet, like very big diurnal shift climate, but we get 44 inches of rain a year. Um, so I'm able to dry farm up there. Which is pretty um, unique for Washington because Washington is incredibly dry, especially like the, the winemaking corners of the state. So Walla Walla and out that way. Yes. I think there are a few vineyards out there, like in the rocks or whatever that area. I feel like some people can dry farm out there. Um, but I actually like, I'm really moving in the direction of with a luxury good like wine. I almost am getting to a place where if you can't do it that way, I don't love the idea of doing it unless you have like a endless reservoir of water. And, you know, that's not the way the world's moving right now. Um, so for me, like, Dry farming in California, in most places, is not very practical. People do it in Mendocino. People do it in Contra Costa. It's the water table. Um, people, there are a few old dry farm vineyards, you know, in Napa and Sonoma. Not many, um, but it's like I conscionably am in like a very interesting like precipice in my life or crossroads where. I'm moving towards actually making less wine, but making wine that's like a higher price point, which was antithetical to what I had originally set out to do because I wanted to make an egalitarian wine that everybody- It doesn't feel very, it doesn't feel very punk rock. Well, it actually, so interestingly, it doesn't feel very punk rock at a face value, but, uh, but like, farming, in a way that is sequestering carbon um, and integrating animals into my farm and food. Um, and that way I feed my crew. I have a free food stand at the bottom of my road where we give food away. We donate food to like the, you know, indigenous fishing villages. Like we a, like long-term plan on having, um, having a restaurant where we'll have a soup kitchen a couple days a week. 
um, and basically just use the ex, ex like the food from our farm to feed our community um, and you know create more opportunities for the people working with us you know like educational opportunities more pay you know paid vacation crisis pay all of that stuff and to me it's like if that means that as a winemaker i say hey this is a luxury good and i have a lower yield because i grow my grapes in a way that is actually better for the environment like why not drink wine a little bit less you know like you don't need to drink a 20 dollars bottle of wine every night i mean we i think that we like to pretend like that's good for us and it's not um but it's like drink wine every four nights and buy an $80 bottle of wine. That's going to be a lot better. And I just think that like, at this point in my life, like I'm thinking about every place I put my foot down, you know, like, like in the sense of like, what am I stepping on? What's lived there? How has it been? And what can I do to like, make sure that as I'm moving through the world, you know, in a, in a world that unfortunately likes, you know, some level of exchange of money and goods is necessary um how can i be a better person um so i think that's pretty fucking punk rock honestly <laughs> <laughs> i didn't mean to do i didn't mean no to no, no no it's, a, no, uh, I'm joking. it's always it's always funny to me like what that means to some people because uh yeah. we had i worked with uh brooks headley who is this awesome um he was the drummer for born against once upon a time oh cool. yeah yeah, yeah. But, uh, he, um, he used to talk about, he was kind of like, he was in like the Fugazi, like, you know, kind of like, uh, like clean, like hardcore kind of uh, camp. And he is now a James Beard award winning pastry chef, but he got into pastry because he didn't want to serve meat. You know, he's a, he was like a vegetarian, like, and they would, you know, do these like, you know, basement shows and go to a local vegan restaurant and, and stuff like that. And he always bemoaned the fact that, you know, there were all these like, you know, supposed punk rockers that had all the external signifiers, but none of the, none of the spirit. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't consider myself, you know, as having a punk uh, aesthetic, aesthetic at all, but I love the, you know, the, the DIY, um, you know, like any establishment, like up from, you know, the bootstraps kind of like ethic of it all. And, and also, you know, the sense of, you know, social responsibility um, that, that comes with that movement. And, um, DC has like this amazing history, you know, in that scene that I don't think people give, you know, necessary weight to. And I think it's like a really important corrective. And it's a really important, like, you know, inspiration for people trying to, you know, um, create a small business, particularly, you know, in, you know, this problematic world that, that we live in. Yeah, I mean, that's been a big differential for me being an East Coaster moving out to California. Like um, I would just had a conversation with a friend of mine the other night who's from BC and I feel like Canadians can kind of fall into this too. Like uh, like more East Coast in a weird sort of way than um, like California. And like, this is like such a crude, gross analogy. And like, hopefully I never have to punch anybody in the face again in my whole life. <laughs> but in BC, if you talk shit, you get punched in the face. And like in most of the world, it's, or not, not most of the world, but like most of like where I am now and like yeah. in this weird movement of like marketing and branding and trying to make yourself look like you're things that you're not because that's what everybody wants to be right now. Like, I just, I think it's like why I wanted to pull out of social media and just like put my head down and just start working on like what I want the world to look like for my children and like our future. And that's like, like, I don't look like a punk rocker anymore besides the tattoos that I decided to get stupidly when I was a teenager. Maybe the, maybe the bangs though, a little bit like. Uh... <laughs> uh, I call these crisis bangs. <laughs> <laughs> the kids have the exact same haircut. It's the only hair I know how to do. Um, but um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that like, there's something really like DC is a really hard place. Um, you know, at least it, it really used to be. And I imagine it still is because there's like a incestuous tentacle of politics that bleeds into everything. And, you know, when you meet somebody in DC, you're like, hi, I'm so-and-so, what do you do? You know, and it's not like that everywhere else. Um, well, I mean, but I, I, I think about that a lot in the context of like visiting Baltimore 
you know, where it's just like, it's usually different. I mean, Baltimore always felt like the Oakland of like the mid Atlantic to me in like a great way. Cause I fucking love Oakland. And, um, yeah. but, uh, you know, by the same token, I think in DC, the, the, the cool spirit of it is, and I think this has changed a lot since I grew up here is that increasingly you have these like really, um, you know, like social justice oriented people, like progressively minded folks who burned out on politics that want to find other ways to, you know, kind of, um, you know, support, uh, you know, the political causes that, you know, they, that are important to them. And, you know, I sling wine for a living, but I still try to include myself in that group. And I think there are a lot of people that, you know, want to make this a, you know, really amazing, you know, place to live. Um, that is a place to live and not just, you know, a, you know, kind of seat of federal government. And, yeah. you know, also like 90% of us voted against, you know, the outgoing president. So that, that's pretty cool. <laughs> DC, it's always like that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, democratic, but I, I agree. I mean, I think that I just, I, um, action is really important to me. Um, and, you know, inaction is basically moving backwards. Um, and uh, not that we don't need to take time sometimes to like reorganize things, but I do find that in the food, like, and this is where kind of natural wine is real problematic for me, like in the food and beverage industry, there's a lot of inaction, but a lot of like simple um, optics and like um, pageantry about being good or doing the right thing. And it's really just shit that they put on Instagram and it's nothing to do with what that like the way that the that they travel through the world and I don't know I mean the, the, you know we're not talking about wine necessarily right now so I don't want to diverge too far off topic but I I just I, I do I do you know like I see you guys at Tail Up Road I know that you guys are are you know a business of action and it is really cool and and I think that there is still a lot of that in DC because it's like people are pushed to experience and acknowledge some some of the inequities in that city at least hopefully at this point even more because it's 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 a completely different place like i like columbia heights i don't even recognize it <laughs> they target now <laughs> i wish i didn't like target <laughs> uh, so do we, do we have any more questions absolutely absolutely um uh, on that same vein, um, great question. What was your favorite experience of the Black Cat in the old days? <laughs> oh, they uh, also, Lord, it should be said, like RIP, I don't know if you know this, but they, they 86 the first floor. I know. So there's I no know. more, like, the, so the best part of the Black, the Black Cat was the fucking back bar and the backstage, which is where, like, I saw my favorite shows I ever saw there. Like, yeah. but it doesn't exist anymore. No more Red Room. I mean, so when you worked there, like, all, like certain people, the staff every night would play like a, a same Elliott Smith song and stuff. Like the, the best part <laughs> about working at the Black Cat was like getting off work at the Black Cat. <laughs> we would just kind of linger for a while and hang out sometimes at the end. Um, I actually, uh, when I worked there was sober. So I didn't, uh, I wasn't drinking as much. I, I drank there a lot underage before that. Um, it's actually kind of infamous there's there's a few people in the in the booze industry still that I run into um there's a guy named Johnny who bartended there forever and I see him in Portland sometimes and he still is like you motherfucker like <laughs> fake ID and everything that's like this is before this is like before 14th street was safe this was like uh oh yeah oh yeah like a very yeah. different yeah. like a black cat black cat bill yeah, and yeah. <laughs> RIP RIP yeah yeah, but um, yeah, I remember I lived at 11th and U, and then I lived at 9th and S. Like I remember walking home from work sometimes, um, even before I worked there, but just walking home from the Black Cat and like having to run, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, or like you know, getting off at the Black Cat and going down to Kingpin when it was still around, and you know, it was an after hours bar. Um, my best friend still to this day, and Charvin, who owned Kingpin, now own a bar in. Santa Fe, New Mexico, which feels exactly like a kingpin. So, oh, that's awesome. But yeah, I miss I miss the old DC, but it but it is nice to kind of see that there's 
like a really cool evolving food and wine scene there. Yeah, but I mean, there's still the kingpins of the world. I mean, the closest thing would be like Showtime or... I mean, Velvet um, Lounge is still there, right? Yeah, but it's not, it's not like, yeah, I, I haven't been there in a minute. Uh, not, not that I'm, I'm not the arbiter of cool. <laughs> well, I feel like, like my, my presence, them. I feel like my presence is like the opposite of, it's like the, probably like the, <laughs> the rubber stamp that, you know, things have, have gone awry, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, what else do you have, Zoe? <laughs> um, La Gitana, is that from the Sherry, your chess piece? No, actually, it was because my best friend Caesar's mother used to call me like La Bohemia and La Gitana. And I got this when I was 19. Uh, Tony Morrell at Jinx Proof did it. Um, and uh, I had no idea what the Sherry was at the time which was very funny because when I went to live in Spain and I had La Gitana tattooed on my chest, mostly people were just like, why do you have gypsy tattooed on your chest? <laughs> You're not, like, because there actually is a Gitano culture. Um, and then in the booze industry, people very frequently think it's for the sherry, but, oh. It's not the worst. I'm glad I can talk about this. Oh yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm okay with it, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the winemaking process of have Franc in particular? Is it like finicky, like Pinot Noir? Um, is it more like hearty? How would you describe growing it? <laughs> Sorry, someone just said, did I, you say you were sober and wasn't drinking them? Yeah, so I was sober. Like I didn't drink um, the year I turned 21. Like I was around 20 when I quit drinking and then didn't drink until I was almost 22. Um, I, when I lived in DC, pre-working at the Black Cap, when I used to hang out at the Black Cat a lot, was also um, uh, involved in, like I, ha I had a very hard life at that point. Um, and it's something I, I, I you know, I, I, I talk openly about like, um, basically I was trafficked into sex work when I was a teenager and was involved with that and a lot of drugs when I lived in DC too. Uh, and then when I quit using that, you know, quit using drugs and, you know, was trying to rehabilitate myself into being, you know, a happy, normal person, I had to quit everything for a while. Um, we call that my feral period. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I was, I was sober, like going to AA meetings sober. Um, Laura, so we just need to, so I, who would play you in the autobiographical movie of you, which is going to come out at some point and be an Oscar winner? I don't know, but she's, uh, no, come on. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't. <laughs> okay. A size 14 though. That's <laughs> no, no, I think that no, it'd be amazing. No, I, um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know I've had a really crazy life and, and I think that's part of why I try to be open about it because it's like a very, like in particular, like the, the sex work side of it and stuff like that, which was maybe about a, two years ago that I started to be more open about like, that's actually what my early life was. And it was in DC. So it was like very dark and weird. And, you know, because of the people who are seeking things like out that out there. Um, but it, um, it's important for me to talk about it though, because I think that there's a lot of women and people, um, you know, who are in those places or stuck in those places in particular right now with the discrepancy of wealth in our society who are afraid that that's where they're going to be for the rest of their lives or don't see the value of themselves as a whole person. And if you don't communicate your true life story, like for other people to know about, like, there's all these other people that are just never going to be reached out to or never feel that they can get to that next level. And um, I think it, it goes a long way toward destigmatizing it for, for people and, you know, exactly. creating more openness around, you know, dialogues, you know, uh, associated with it. And I think, you know, it, especially in, in our business, in the wine business, it's important to acknowledge that we're dealing with fire. Like alcohol is potentially hugely destructive. Yes. Yeah, and and it's, it's important to, you know, equally acknowledge that, you know, um, while we, you know, celebrate it. Yep. Um, at Heidi, the, the, the saddest part about, um, the situation is that it, that the women are ashamed of trafficking and not their sex work and not the traffickers. Um, it was actually two women. It was an older lady couple that, um, got me and my young friends involved in that. So it's, it's kind of like a weird, like, I think that's been a, a part of, you know, understanding and moving through that. That's been a little hard. Um, but it, uh, 
it's it's still yeah sadly like the people who are being traded essentially who walk away with the shame not the people doing it um yeah sorry <laughs> that was like i like i didn't mean to like have a big but i just I, I, when i get to the point where i'm like trying to explain it and everything i'm just like oh fuck it this is what happened <laughs> um, but uh yeah i mean i i think that since I've been really open about that, a lot of young people in our industry or people trying to crack into the wine industry have reached out and it's like been really nice. And, you know, I, I'm a big subscriber to the each one teach one philosophy. And, you know, I try to be there for other people who are, you know, coming through some sort of adversity and end up in an industry of luxury, which is really weird. Um, you know, if you feel like that's where you're being called, but you have a low self-esteem because of things that happened when you were young, like working through that is, it's important. Yeah. Um, I imagine it could have some of the same, you know, exploitative kind of undertones as, uh, 100%. I mean, that's, that's a big part of like where I'm ending up with you know being like well fine i'm just going to make a more expensive wine yeah. and by making yeah. a more expensive wine i'm going to take care of the earth and the people who you know are working for me like and you know and make sure everybody's like heard and everybody's part of the conversation you know like the communication i, I have with my crew is never like hey you do this like we talk about what's going on yeah. and you i was know, like i don't want to be your natural wine it girl you know i i want to you know, do my own thing <laughs> Oh yeah, no, and that that happened like actually very early on in my winemaking career. I got a lot of that like ooh young like natural wine attention. I mean, fortunately, around the same time, I was also pregnant for. <laughs> Which years. is we Please. we met you so we we first met you just like shortly after you given birth and uh, you used to yeah, I think I with me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, that was, I was think I was able to like, not get pulled into that, but like, I felt it. And I mean, I felt the, like, like if I wanted to grab onto that and be some sort of it girl, I could have, but like, that's not like, I was talking to a girlfriend of mine right now, who's trying to start making wine or she's making wine and she's a young, beautiful, incredible, like super smart, talented woman. And like, I really hope you know for everybody who's getting into this that you choose that you want to be a part of this because you believe in it and you make the decisions that like that attention like maybe getting all that special attention in the beginning isn't what's going to like make you a happy long-term successful winemaker like like again i i really like that analogy you had about you know where which table would you be sitting at because i don't want anything to do with like the the table that's constantly trying to tell everybody who they are and what they do or like take any attention they can get like winemaking in its ultimate place and grape growing in particular are very quiet and like internal practices um and you know that's like what I want people to take away from it. I, like there's a lot of people wanting to become like, or it seems like wanting to become winemakers or part of the wine community because there's a lot of attention around it right now. And like that will never, you'll never find what you're looking for if what you're looking for is attention. Especially, especially working on a vineyard. <laughs> well, yeah, or like, you know, like, making wine like people just think oh well, i made a wine well now i'm gonna put it in a bottle and it's gonna have a cool label and like it's gonna be easy and it's like no <laughs> like you're gonna do that and you'll maybe have a few thousand dollars and then you have to do it again <laughs> you know so but um on the the cab franc note uh to, <laughs> do you pr do you pronounce it zoe mm -hmm. sure. okay um i i have a my older daughter the 22 year old uh, her middle name is zoe but we just say so in my family because for her I, it family. doesn't help things Laura because I just I call her I am I'm notoriously impatient when it comes to names so I'm usually like dealing in monosyllables so I just say Zoe uh even though you know I know that her name is Zoe so you have the perfect name for that <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> um yeah so Cabernet Franc and gen like the traditional Cabernet Franc making in the Loire frequently is around 30 percent whole cluster um, it's not prescript, like it's not prescriptive really, but that's typically what you're going to get. Um, that whole cluster input gives it a bit more um, 
of like a tannin in particular, like, so the, it's like usually a neutral barrel and like a partial whole cluster fermentation and that the whole cluster quality like gives you this kind of, I don't want to say chewy because when I feel like people yeah. describe it as chewy, it's usually like carbonic and whole cluster and it's like too much. Um, but it gives it this like uh, more like, uh, the French have different words for different kinds of tannins, which I always find really helpful. You know, yeah. so it's it just, it's like crunchy. the- Cr yeah. Crunchy, I actually think is a, a bit, like chewy is like, you know, yeah. like I think yeah. of like, like caramel on my teeth, but it's, it's a crunchy tannin, a brighter tannin. Um, and then uh, in California, like a lot of the, um, a lot of the, uh, kind of conventional Napa winemakers, it's all about like they pick really late to get all of the sugars and the extraction that they possibly can. And then a lot of times they'll add back some acid to like put, you know, to fill in what's been stripped or, out. Or water just to make more wine. Yeah, well, a lot of times they add water and acid and then illegally, if they can't get enough bricks, we'll even add sugar. I mean, it's, oh. and then and then purple color stuff. Like purple juice yeah <laughs> but um it's a bigger like more formulaic wine um and then as far as like like the type of wine that you guys were drinking for me that has no uh, stem inclusion um that's just distemmed and fermented with like really nothing going on i punch like the the main difference is that i'll punch down so like, you know, move the cap to the bottom once a day instead of twice today, twice a day, because I'm not looking for a ton of extraction in that wine. I want it to be kind of light and fun. Um, and then, uh, but in general, like the kind of modality of like new California winemaking, it's probably somewhere between what I do and what they do in Europe. Like I know that Matthiasen does some stem inclusion. I think Brock does some carbonic and carbonic is a different type of fermentation where you you seal the fermentation vessel and then carbon dioxide builds. Either you can add carbon dioxide externally or if you just keep it sealed, eventually the fermentation will start, a regular fermentation, fill the vessel with carbon dioxide and then a different type of fermentation will happen inside of the berry called carbonic fermentation. That you usually get like more brighter smells. You can get kind of like a gasoline smell or a bubblegum smell. Like usually if you stick your nose into a really young glass of wine and you get like like fruity kind of like god, tutti god forbid banana runs oh yes <laughs> <laughs> you'll get these like fruity bright smells and um and that can that that can be a sign of carbonic does laura have any special vessels that she prefers concrete eggs oh yeah we're so um, good laura you need to know that we <laughs> we are all about uh, alternative vessels for the sake of fermentation so uh concrete eggs have taken on a bit of a vogue in class uh, we've done a couple classes on Georgian wine because I love Georgian wine. So everybody knows what a cavevery is. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a lot of interest in, uh, in you know, vessels. I, um, mainly because I just didn't have a lot of money when I started making wine, don't have any special vessels. <laughs> you know, I, I use tea bins and I have some, some nice uh, VCs I bought off a guy who was getting rid of all his winery stuff. So like a variable capacity tank. Um, and then I use tanks and I don't really, so interesting in California, interestingly in California, I'm not really even a big fan of like barrel fermentation with white wine because the pH is higher. Um, so you have less acid. Um, I think that with my Washington stuff, because it's mountain fruit and I have ripper acidity, I'll probably do a little bit of barrel, barrel fermentation. You're going to invest in concrete? I'm, I'm not. Like, okay. I, like I'm probably what I'm probably going to do is get some like big old barriques. Okay. Um, I like the what neutral um, oak aging, like especially large format, can do to wines. Um, concrete. So you know that you have to like climb into a concrete tank. And oh yeah, and yes, and they're they're way more fragile than people commonly let on. Well, yeah, and you have to like treat it with all of this crazy acid so that like it doesn't destroy your wine and all like in your wine does leach the concrete. Like I, like for me, concrete, I like wines that are made in concrete, but I can always taste it. All right. 
and that's just like and I I can enjoy it but I think it's why I'm not super into it I mean I think quiveries are really cool but I also am not making wine in Georgia and it would just feel like a poser <laughs> <laughs> they're they're actually they're a huge pain in the ass they're easier they're also easier ways to work in clay than working in quivery um yeah uh, it's just I don't know it's it's an interesting I always it's it's for me it's like concrete it's a discernible signature on a wine that I enjoy because it you get this like rapier like acidity uh on those wines and you know it elevates this like savory dimension that they you know wouldn't have otherwise that I find kind of beguiling and, and fun with food yeah I mean I like it like I like it it's like fake petrichor <laughs> um, again another that's, 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 another band, that's another punk band name like fake petrichor <laughs> Um, like it's really. Well, I think we really had petrichor on our bingo today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I don't know. Well, we'll see. I mean, I you know when I was when I was younger, I I really wanted because at Unti we did work with uh, with concrete. We had an egg and we had tanks, um, and then I did like a very short. Um, very short internship at the Mandela Coat where they had tons of them. Um, but uh, yeah, th they're cool. I like them. I just like, I feel like, like I think that I would just feel like I'm cheating. So. No, I think, I think too, like um, you can, you can respect art, but not embrace it as your own. You know, you can, you can like, you can respect the way someone else is working, but you know, acknowledge the fact that you can never work that way. You know, that's and, how I feel about whole cluster carignan. I mean, <laughs> oh, I love whole cluster. I love, so I love the I love the stemmy wines. Uh, um, and it's funny, like I was just tasting some of those from like Roussillon makes these amazing like whole cluster like gems, and they're like ridiculously. I mean, yeah, I mean they kind of have a cellar imprint because the whole cluster has its own you know signature. But I, I think they're they get like Pinot like in this really cool way. I, yeah, they're they're fun ones. I, you know, the only time I've done uh, stem inclusion was with, um, I have a little uh, vineyard I farm in Carneros that's dry farmed Pinot Noir Nebbiolo Sangiovese. And I do a little stem inclusion with that. Um, in 18, I did a little, in 19, I actually did a lot. Um, and then in Washington, I have a Syrah Viognier blend I make um, and I do stem inclusion in that. But it, to me, actually, it's funny because like, I don't like a lot of those Southern French, like, like bigger, like kind of like. Well, another, so actually more, more, so one of my favorite um, wines out of the region is from uh, Gord de Chalet, which is another like uh, three generation strong, like a matriarchy, uh, yeah. like winery. Yeah. Yeah, know them. I'll just yeah, they're awesome. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's just, it, that's, um, it's not a style of wine I gravitate towards, not to say that it's, it's not. Yeah good uh, you know i i just i'm probably never going to make a carbonic carignan <laughs> cluster, yeah. um, and laura what's the name of your project in washington um so i think we're going to call it lorelei um if we can get that name we're working on it right now because there's a couple beers called lorelei and a beer bar um and yeah, so that, that that's the hopeful the hopeful name, and then we're working on the plans to building a winery right now. Currently, I bring the fruit to California, which is not optimal, but I have a winery down there, so it's easier than trying to make wine in two places. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's I, I, if any of you guys are up in the Columbia Gorge area, you're welcome to reach out, and I'm happy to show you the property. It's beautiful. Um, but yeah, we have uh, right now it's 20 acres and then I farm the neighboring vineyard, which is like another 10, 15 acres. Um, and then I have like a three acre area where I have pigs and goats and chickens and Anatolian shepherds I'm training for when I get my sheep. That's and, adorable. Yeah. Uh, was it, when we first, it's, it's really cool to see you, you know, have your own bit of land. When we first met you, you were hoping to uh, make Riesling in Montana, but I feel yeah. like, you know, yeah. uh, you know, Columbia, Columbia Gorge, you know, not so carbonic Carignan or, you know, uh, yeah. Cap, Franc, Cap Franc is, is, you know, equally worthwhile. Well, I'll plant, uh, definitely be planting some Riesling. Awesome. Right now I have mainly like Alsatian stuff and some Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. 
like Pinot, lots of Pinot Gris, Gewurz, um, Viognier, um, but it's uh, and Sauvignon Blanc, but it's like a really aromatic Sauvignon Blanc that's super cool. Um, so, Sabi B doesn't, we, we love Sabi B. Like it's a. Have you had wines from Bonanote? Uh, no. Okay, so he gets um, some of my Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, cool. I'll look for it. And, um, have you ever had the Hayu Albarino? Uh, I know those guys. Uh, I fucking love those wines. Their cider is like. Oh, I love their cider. Yeah. It's really good. I haven't had the, I'm not familiar with the Albarino. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's the vineyard I'm farming now. I'm oh, actually sure. trying to buy the, um, the house on that vineyard. They're proper hippies. Oh yeah, Nate, Nate, I, I, I love, I love Nate to death. Yeah, like he, yeah. he and Ryan are dear friends. Um, yeah, they're, we really we, uh, community up in the gorge. We so. carry their wine at uh, Telco. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right, we should, we should let you go. You have to get on with your day. It's, uh, it's going on one o'clock, uh, Hawaiian standard time. We are honored that you spent this much time with us, Laura. Thank you so much, uh, for being, you know, as, you know, you know, honest and, you know, just awesome uh, uh, as you are. Uh, and uh, it's been super fun to talk through Cab Francs and to talk over your winemaking journey. And we hope to do it again, certainly. Like, this is this is wonderful. I, I, I love you guys' this restaurant. I love what you do. Um, every time I've talked to you, Bill, it's always an absolute pleasure. And yeah, and, and, and thanks to all you guys for, for listening to me blab on about Cabernet Franc, so. <laughs> It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And Zoe, I like, I, I, I have met you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I'm so, I'm sorry. Like I, <laughs> the, the last couple of sure. times we've been through DC, I have either had a very new baby with me or it's been mm -hmm. insanity. Um, so I, yeah, I look forward to like when the world is not a burning tire fire anymore, like having a glass of wine with you and hanging out more. Cause it was really nice to have this chat. Absolutely. Thanks so much. We are, we're ready for this disaster to be over so we can all travel as well. Yes. <laughs> well, cheers to you, Laura, in paradise. Uh, cheers, everybody. Home. Aloha. Salud. Thanks. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right. Thanks, all right. guys. Thanks.